Hey, welcome to Zoom Around Town with Jamie Jansen. I'm here with special guest Ryan Coonerty of the 3rd District in Santa Cruz County. And we are here to talk about the current events. Thanks so much for joining us, Ryan. Thanks, Jamie. You are, you are Zooming uh, around town by every, literally and metaphorically. Yeah, I'm in my, doing this interview from my car. Um, <laughs> So um, we have uh, quite a list of questions to ask you. First, I just want to say thank you so much for your contribution to the community. I know you've been a pillar in this community for quite some time. And just being a resident of Bonnie Dune, it's been so amazing to hear your like direct response to all of, um, all of us in the community. It's just been heartwarming. And just we want to thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you. It's um, the way the community has really come together and support each other. Uh, has been one of the best uh, things that's come out of this tragedy. And um, I'm glad to, to help people uh, along the way as they're helping each other. Yeah, absolutely. So we do have a quite a long list of questions. So let's get right, get right to it. Um, I know one of them was about, um, I mean, I think you have it in front of you, but one of them was about PG&E and repopulate yeah. and like getting power back, I think. So, um, so yeah, so PG&E uh, has uh, dedicated a lot of resources to restoring power. I think they're putting up uh, more than 400 poles uh, replacing and then transmission lines. Um, we're pushing them to go as fast as they can on getting uh, power up. It still seems uh, September 18th, September 19th to be the day uh, where they think that the areas that don't have power will have power restored, but um, but we will continue to push them to to get the power up as quickly and as safely as possible. Did you have any comment on um, how they were putting them up? I mean, I I was up here the other day and I was noticing that there were a lot of trees cut down that maybe didn't necessarily need to be cut down that were living. I mean, do we have? I mean, is that in like the jurisdiction of the people whose property it is, or how does that work? Uh, so yeah, so the tree removal right now is being done by two entities, uh, neither of which are controlled by the county. Uh, one is Cal Fire and they're removing trees that they consider to be dangerous uh, for falling on roadways, uh, restarting new fires, that sort of thing. Uh, and then PG&E is removing trees uh, that may impact power lines. Uh, and both are using uh, arborists um, but I know that um, the scale, the operation that is happening, uh, it's not allowing uh, some members of the community to feel like they have input, uh, but it's difficult in a, in a scale and a situation like this um, to go tree by tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally understand that. Um, let's see, Patty Murray says, tell you that you have been such a great source of information and a leader of this, of, and a great leader of your time. So I just wanna put that out there for you. Thank you, um, nice to hear. Some, someone else has said, I've appreciated how you've responded to uh, the individual personally by email. You're very kind and responsive. Um, Jill says, be sure and tell him to keep up all of the great work. So you've definitely got some amazingly happy constituents. I mean, it's, in this time of chaos, it's been, um, you've really risen to the occasion. What is your, um, like, how did you do it? How are you, how are you holding it together? Um, I, the short answer is I'm not sure I'm how I'm holding it together <laughs> um, uh, because uh, managing the COVID crisis and the subsequent economic crisis has been uh, extremely challenging uh, to start yeah. with. Um, and then I think people know uh, my, my, I, every supervisor gets two aides uh, that, to work with. And so my, uh, one of my aides and my longtime friend uh, was killed in June. Uh, so we've been doing this uh, with half the staff um, that we've had before and also oh mour mourning her loss. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just been a, it's been a lot of adrenaline, but again, it's also that, um, it's, it's easy to help when people are helping each other um, and you just want to be some, part of something positive. Yeah, I'm so sorry for your loss. That's so tragic. Yeah. Um, so let's go on to some more questions here. Um, again, someone else appreciating you for your generous communication efforts. Um, they're wanting to have a way to funnel ideas and concerns for the future of Santa Cruz and fire prevention. How will that look for post-repopulation and prepping for 2021? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good question. And I think we're recognizing as we sit under an orange sky um, that we are definitely in a new normal and climate change is having a profound impact, not on Santa Cruz, obviously, but uh, the entire world, but you're seeing it in California right now. Um, I think we are gonna have to take a new approach uh, to uh, reducing fire, uh, the risk of fires, uh, inevitable fires that will be coming. Um, and I think there'll be, a, it's like anything, there's no single answer. So I think we'll be working with the planning department on trying to make sure that when we uh, build, there's defensible space um, planned and built in. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we'll be working with the different uh, CSAs uh, to make sure that they're doing uh, uh, landscape, uh, the appropriate landscape and protections in that way. Uh, we'll be working with the Fire Safe Council and the Resource Conservation District to get resources to people so they can better manage their own properties. Certainly, the public properties we have to we have uh, state parks uh, all you know as a significant portion of land ownership on the North Coast, um, and we'll have to work with them uh, on their properties as well as the federal government on the Coast Aries National Monument. So it's going to take. Uh, everybody focused I, and then obviously we we have to work on the communications infrastructure um, so that people can have appropriate warnings and ability to communicate with each other in the event of a crisis so I think we'll be working with each one of those pieces one of the things I've appreciated is that um, a number of people again have started having that conversation in the community it's really hard to do these things when it's a top-down approach it's much easier when the community collectively decides the direction they want to go and um, starts, you know, uh, sharing and aligning resources. And so I've appreciated some of the conversations that even in the midst of this crisis, people are already thinking ahead. Yeah, we, um, we've we been talking, myself, and we've created a committee. I'm on a committee for the Bonnie Dune um, Fire Relief Fund. And so we've had this idea of generating captains in Bonnie Dune for neighborhoods and then having emails and phone numbers so that each captain it, like there'll be two captains for each neighborhood so that information can get disseminated and also uh, pro appropriate warning can happen. I mean, my, uh, my sister's mom, my sister-in-law's mom lived in Last Chance and she did not get a reverse 911 call. She got a call from her neighbor saying, you need to leave right now. You have less than five minutes. Yeah. And I think, you know, we're going to be doing a post uh, fire incident review or Cal Fire does that. Um, and we're going to try to document each one of the places where um, there was much better, there's much more room for improvement for notifications or for fire response or for recovery. Uh, all those things. Um, I mean, overall, I think uh, the net result of uh, a fire of this magnitude and unfortunately having one life lost, which is one too many, but, but it could have been much worse. Right. Uh, but I still think that we, we need to learn because, again, we are heading into a, a different normal um, and we need to, to structure our we all the communication systems uh, or lack thereof. Uh, the building uh, and fire prevention was all built for one reality. And now we're in a very different reality because of climate change. Yeah. One of the things also that's interesting is. Um, some people don't necessarily agree with that statement of climate change. So, I mean, this is kind of proof, I guess, with the temperature. I mean, have you ever seen a temperature uh, in a storm with that many lightning uh, strikes in this county? No, I mean, I, you know, uh, like you and I are both born and raised here. I've never seen lightning like that before. Right? Uh, I've never yeah, seen these, these uh, swings in temperature uh, where we have so many over 100 degree days. Um, it's it's really scary. And, and, you know, we had one of the reasons this fire, or the fires across the state have been so bad. It's because we had many years of drought. And so you have dead trees essentially mm -hmm. acting as kindling. Um, it's a, it's, we're seeing it firsthand. And um, I think uh, you'd have to be crazy to, to deny climate change at this point. Right. Uh, right. I agree and, with that. And not prepare for that reality. Right. What do you think about, I know that there's, I mean, myself included was a volunteer here up on the hill, and I'm wondering, um, what do you think about having a better organized volunteer? Because 
if this is really going to be our new reality, having the uh, number of Cal Fire on this fire was just not enough. And it wasn't because they're not responsive. It's because there's just a million fires going on in the state at the same time. So how, what do you think about like neighborhood crews and kind of like the, what are they calling us, the renegades of the mountain? Like, how, how do you think that worked out in this fire? And what do you think about doing something a little bit more organized in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think um, that those discussions start to happen. And I do think there, there's going to be an absolute role. And um, in my time on the board, I really tried to support the CERT team, uh, which and the Fire Safe Council, which are sort of the early indicators uh, the early efforts to sort of coordinate uh, uh, fire response. It's mm -hmm. challenging having been um, often over the last couple of weeks between the renegades and Cal Fire. Right. Um, you know, Cal Fire has to worry about a state of 38 million people. And so anything they approve in Santa Cruz has to be also work in oh, I see. Eno and Tahoe mm -hmm. and Sonoma and you know, it's, um, and they're worried about state liability and it's a, it's a big bureaucracy. And then you have uh, locals that are being very resourceful and agile. And I think we're going to have to, and both need each other in the situation. So I think we're going to have to figure out um, what it takes to make sure that everybody's coordinated. Uh, my sense is the CAL FIRE crews on the ground um, were able to coordinate well uh, with the community members um, for how, using community members to understand the terrain, to water resources. So I think it happened, I think the coordination was pretty good on the ground. It's trying to get it at the, the next level and the next level up that will be really uh, key. Yeah, when I was, you know, helping out, I definitely noticed that there was really good camaraderie even and communication with the CAL FIRE and the, the people on the ground. and. I know that Brisa Del Mar a community up in Bonnie Dune, they had an incredible map. They were able to show the firefighters to show them like where all the fire roads were, where all the hydrants were, how they could get to certain places if they had extra hoses. And it was just so helpful. And so they were able to really protect that area because there was such great communication. Yeah. And I think, and I think that's a, that, you know, that should be a lesson learned from this is that uh, understanding because we will have Cal Fire crews coming in from outside the area. Um, it's not easy to understand where you are uh, in Bonnie Dune in the best of times. Uh, and um, getting that local knowledge uh, of, the, of the mountain and of water hookups and, and other uh, activities, you know, it's really, um, I think that'll be essential going forward. So people I know have some questions. I don't know if you're going to be able to answer these ones because it just really depends on the timeline here, but people are really wanting to get back to their house on Summit, Robles, and Vic, or I guess what's left of their house. Um, do you have any idea when that will be open? Uh, what I'm, uh, and again, I'm not, I don't make the decisions about the roadblocks. Uh, it's a coordinated effort among Cal Fire and the sheriff in consultation. Right. But um, I am hearing and hopeful uh, that it may be just a matter of days, if not sooner, um, that that part of uh, Bonnie Dune can be opened up. Is there still going to be a high level of police around the area? Because, you know, myself included, I'm not able to live at my home. And so, you know, I know my neighbor who has decided to rough it and um, be in his smoke infested house. You know, I have a 93 year old living with me, so I can't really do that. But he's he's checking my property every day. But I'm just wondering, uh, you know, people have been com commenting that there's people skipping rocks on their pond that's left or, you know, walking out through their woods. And how is it, how is this all going to be kind of policed? Or is it something that we're going to have to do on our own? So uh, I think the, the Sheriff's Department is really committed um, to preventing, you know, looting and property damage. And I think... I know there were a lot of concerns, but at the end of the day, as, as people have been repopulated, um, we haven't seen a lot of evidence of that. And so we will have to continue to maintain patrols. The challenge part, challenging part for our county is, um, you know, the mutual aid uh, that allowed us to have 100 officers on duty instead of the 10 usual, usually ones we have on a given shift. Um, that mutual aid is gone. So we're, we're back to our normal staffing. But I think the sheriff has made it a priority to, to continue to patrol uh, the fire impacted areas. And I'll, I'll make it my priority to continue to, to advocate for that with the, the sheriff's office. 
Oh, great. Thank you so much. Uh, Michelle asks, can we have some help from the county clearing additional fuel chipping, maybe even a controlled burn? Can the county provide hauling and or chipping of fuel that we clear? Can the county provide dumpsters for excess, excess trash as we repopulate? So, uh, okay, so there's a lot of questions in there. Um, yeah. So, uh, so on the uh, reducing the fuel load, um, yes, as, as CAL FIRE um, continues to get containment and get this under control, there'll be resources um, to try to uh, help property owners do that. Um, we did uh, just minutes ago uh, released a um, information about how people can um, put out their trash, especially refrigerators. Uh, we need them to empty their refrigerators, put those in trash bags, uh, set them out, and um, we will uh, come by and uh, pick them up. Um, so that's uh, one element to that question. Um, let me just see. Where, where would we find that information? So, uh, so I just posted it to the slice page. The county just put out a public uh, um, a and the North Davenport North Coast Association page. The county just put out a press release, so if it gets picked up. Uh, but if you go to the solid waste uh, Department of Public Works, they'll have the information there. So it's uh, bulky items and refrigerators, including refrigerators, can be scheduled for pickup by calling customer service at 426-2711 uh, for asking food to be removed from, fri uh, from fridges and placed in a cart or a bag. Uh, and um, so we're trying to, uh, and we'll set, you, you could set it out with your trash cart at no additional charge. So, oh, uh, cool. So also, Green Waste would do that? Yeah, Green Waste is doing that. Uh, the county is, is uh, subsidizing Green Waste to do it. Uh, we're also um, going to be having a large debris removal process that we can talk about uh, down the road. But, um, but that's what we're doing for folks who are, um, you know, whose homes are okay, but they may have lost uh, the food in their fridge or the fridge themselves. Okay. All right. Awesome. And so as far as the chipping of the fuel that people, because so now everyone who has a home left, or even if they don't, they're looking in when they're rebuilding, they're wanting to clear that, that healthy area around their house to create a natural fire break. How, how is the natural fuel of the trees and stuff going to be taken care of? So um, we will, for the, for the houses that are still standing, um, I believe they're going to have to work with uh, an arborist or, uh, or uh, do it themselves um, and just go through the traditional process. Okay. Uh, but we'll be working on the public lands and some other areas at reducing, creating more fire breaks uh, uh, or fire resistant planting, landscaping. Awesome. And then, uh, yeah, so that was the question. Will Cal Fire remove the dead trees on the property or is that gonna be like, if it's private property, we need to talk to an arborist? Uh, so the, I believe Cal Fire's I mean, as, as we talked about earlier, and PG&E have cut and removed trees. But if you get back to your property and there's a tree there um, that you believe is dead, you need to remove it as you would normally. Okay. Ha what is the process? I think that you guys, you and the other supervisors were going to talk about uh, permitting easement or like creating an easier way for us to be able to rebuild. Um, what's the progress on that? Yeah, so, um, so we directed the staff to work on it and they're coming back to us uh, on Tuesday, um, on the 15th, uh, with what they, the, the, the new process. Um, we've been talking to them. In fact, I just got off a call with them. Uh, they're doing their best to reduce fees, to streamline the permitting process, bring in uh, outside uh, folks to, to assist with that because the sheer number is gonna overwhelm uh, our process and so we need additional capacity making sure that all the um, all the all, all the departments are coordinating so you're not going to get one answer from planning and a different one from public works or environmental health uh, and so we're working on that for both people who had permitted dwellings so that they can rebuild uh, what they had uh, and the and this was this came up earlier but it's always good to remember so you can fill out a form at the county tax assessor's website. Uh, if you lost your home to, uh, to reduce your property taxes, 
Uh, and when you rebuild your home, you can keep your Prop 13 tax basis as long as you're rebuilding what you had before. Um, and then we're beginning the process of trying to figure out how to make it uh, easier for people who didn't have permits to rebuild um, so that, um, so because we recognize there are people, lots of people up there and uh, we need to help. Um, so they made their, their new uh, uh, house will have to meet current standards. Right. Uh, we can't waive, we can't waive state uh, standards uh, and pay fees like permitted structures. Uh, but we can try to figure out how to waive penalty fees and allow people to come into come into the process. So what is the best route for them to go? Do they just go to the Kaiser Permanente Arena or do they contact somebody at the county planning department or what's the best way to do this? And is it something that we can get started on right away or we still need to wait for the hazmat removal? So, um, uh, I mean, I think it's a good thing to get started on right away. Um, you can go to the Resource Recovery Center, uh, which is down at the Kaiser, as you said, at the Kaiser Permanente Center, uh, you, or you can go to the County Planning Department and start to figure out, uh, start to get the application process going. Um, as you mentioned, there will be a hazmat cleanup process that I'm sure we can talk about um, uh, going forward, but, um, but it's not a bad idea to get the paperwork started uh, and to start to move through the process. Although um, we're getting the report on Tuesday, so, uh, so we won't have everything in place um, for, for a little while after that, but, but, you can, but I think all the departments sort of know where we're going and what we want in terms of a fast and less expensive process. And right. uh, so we can start, start getting people into that. So there's um, some individuals like you were mentioning that definitely, you know, had they been assessed may have been red tagged. So at what point are we going to know about the waiving of the fees? Because I could imagine some people don't even want to go down to the county building for fear that they're going to be, you know, they're now in a trauma, their house burned down or part of it burned down and now they have to go and do all this permitting stuff for structures that the county didn't even know existed. So I could imagine they just want to build without permits again. Yeah, and I think, um, I mean, I think that's the recognition that we have is that um, if we don't figure out a way to get people into the process, then they will likely build without permits again, which is not good for them or us, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we're going to have to figure out a process and requirements um, to do it. And some of it, I think we can do the stuff that the county is in control of, um, we can do by allowing people to be, uh, you know, have a, a permitted non-conforming structure. Um, the stuff that we are sort of, that's out of our control, which is fire access um, and septics are much trickier. Uh, and so we're gonna have to try to figure out what we can do to help people. But, um, but you know, when you build, uh, and operate legally. It's a, it, it it's it's by definition more costly uh, right. than than not doing it. But you also get um, benefits, and so first and foremost being safety. Uh, so right. uh, so we're tr going to try to walk that line and do everything we can within our power to make that possible for people. Awesome. All right, and then tell us if you have any information on the hazmat removal. I know like a good 90% of my property burned along with some structures. Uh, I don't know if I'm on, the, on a list. Do I need to go and um, get on a list to have someone come out and remove it? Do I like put stuff in trash bags? Like what's the process? I know that there's sifters that people are handing out. I don't really want to sift. I don't want to get near that stuff. How do we get rid of our hazmat? Sure. So, um, so yeah. So first and foremost, um, we did a uh, damage assessment report. Uh, it's available online. If the damage assessment report is not accurate, email me at ryan.coonerty at santacruzcounty.us and I'll get your information to that mapping team. They're doing a lot of work because uh, uh, it was some. It was fairly accurate the first assessment, but there were lots of places, especially like up in Braymore where the um, 
the underlying map is just off. So we're trying to go through and fix it by hand. So that's the first piece. The second piece is um, we have uh, repopulation kits that are available at the fire station in Bonnie Dune. And um, as things are opened up in, um, on the North Coast, it'll be at uh, uh, the Davenport Resource Center um, and also at the fire stations uh, in Boulder Creek um, and I think Felton. Uh, and in those kits, we have uh, instructions for how to uh, return to a damaged property. Um, there's a mask in there to protect your breathing. Uh, and there's, you know, we really want people to be careful about touching this material because it is toxic. Um, and uh, there's no prohibition against people going onto their own property and, you know, looking for sentimental items or other things. Um, but we don't, you don't want to disturb it too much because one, it's unhealthy. Uh, and two, um, if you, if you cause too much disturbance, it can cause you real problems with insurance companies uh, uh, and other entities down the road. Um, but we, uh, so we have been approved by Cal EPA to help with a public cleanup of hazmat. Um, the last I heard is that they'll be in town starting on Monday, September 14th, um, but it's going to take them about a week to mobilize and then they'll start to do the hazmat cleanup. The service is going to be free, so um, they will go around and do it uh, and um, bring, the, bring it to an appropriate location because the landfills will not take hazardous materials. Uh, and then, that, so that's the first phase. The second phase is a uh, public debris removal process where people will have an opportunity to opt in. They do not have to opt in, but they can opt in. Uh, and that debris removal uh, will, uh, could be run by Cal EPA as well. And they'll come in and uh, take all the materials. It's free if you don't have insurance. If you do have insurance, you have to list your insurance and they will, they will bill the insurance company for it. Um, but we are working on getting the final approvals for that phase two because we know it's gonna be a big benefit to a lot of people in the community to reduce those costs. So how do we get in touch with them to make sure that our property's listed, just reach out to you? Uh, yeah, if you go to the damage assessment map, the Santa Cruz County damage assessment map, um, you can check your, your property yourself. Uh, and if it's not correct, um, do let me know. Okay, awesome. And so when you say debris removal, is that just for the housing debris or actual like tree debris, that kind of stuff too? So I think it's going to be, it'll be everything from, you know, cars to houses to foundations. Uh, oft oftentimes one thing people think is their foundation's okay, but when a fire is burned this hot, um, they actually often have to take out the foundation. Uh -huh. uh, and so removing all of that, the ash, the toxic ash, um, it'll be, it'll be all of those sorts of materials. Wow. So if you have, I mean, this is a lot of wildfire. So if you have ash in the trees, I mean, like on the forest floor, I mean, that's not just the trees that burn, that's also the house, but there's no way, like, are we expected to like clean that, like rake the ground? I mean, what are you, or are you just talking directly around the house? So I think I believe that the um, that the hazmat uh, well, the hazmat is the removal of hazardous materials. The debris removal will be uh, around the house and the the sort of built parts of the of the property. Okay. All right. Um, so, and you said that's going to be in a couple weeks. Uh, so the. The hazmat will start, they'll get here next week and then they will um, start doing the work the following week. The, the debris removal opt-in program, we are still uh, pushing to get that approved by the state um, and managed by the state. So we, that, that's, there's more information to come about that. Okay, great. And then someone asked about when and how does FEMA cleanup begin? So I'm assuming that this is kind of what you're talking about right now. Yes, that's the, that's it. And the FEMA covers the cost for the, for the debris removal and dumping um, and the hazardous materials. So uh, people can do it on their own. 
uh, but it's on their own dime and it has to be done to the standards. Uh, it has to be done by qualified, uh, the hazmat removal has to be done by qualified people and that material will not be accepted at our landfill. So they have to make sure that the company they're working with gets it to an appropriate uh, place for hazardous materials. Okay. And how safe is it to live in a home while the hazmat removal process is occurring all around? Uh, yeah, so uh, that's a very good question. And I asked that today to our environmental health director, uh, Dr. Underwood, uh, you know, says that these folks are professionals and they will, they have a process where they will wet down the, the materials uh, and not cause damage. And if there is a threat to adjacent properties, they will let them know. But she felt comfortable that if you're using, you know, professional debris removal, hazmat removal, that they will, uh, that living and adjacent properties will be safe, unless you're notified otherwise. Uh-huh, all right, that sounds awesome. And then can we have, this is, I didn't, I'm not asking this, but somebody is, can we have our community center back from Cal Fire so we can better provide for our community ourselves? We need a community center for the next time we have a disaster. Will you help us get our community center? This is so, somebody in Ronnie Dune. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so the that Madermic fire station has a long history um, and I started to read the thread um, to understand it. My understanding is that it is meant to be a fire station. Um, and I think if anything's proved uh, by this fire is that we need uh, more fire resources rather than less. Um, and so um, there may be a spot uh, for a community center, but I don't think um, converting a fire station um, is how we want to do it. I think that's a good point. That's a great point. Will, um, will residents have any input about what gets removed with public debris removal option, like on their property, I believe? Yeah, so, um, so for the debris removal, you get to be on your property and have a say if it's removed. Um, uh, and you can also um, have the debris removal, just you could do it yourself through a private contract uh, and your insurance company if you want. But for the public debris removal, yes, you can be there. For the hazardous materials removal, materials, um, they will work with property owners if people raise concerns or are present, but, um, but that is done under California public health law. Um, and so they're not required to have your permission to come on your property, whereas in the debris removal stage, uh, they, they will have your permission and you can be there. Awesome. How do we handle fixing fin uh, private roads financially? I know I'm on a private road. I know that um, Summit is a private, I believe Summit Drive is a private road. So is there any funding like FEMA or something that can help pay for that? Or how, how what do you suggest? So uh, we've had just initial conversations uh, with the county council to look at it. And right now it looks as though FEMA will not um, fund private roads. Uh, also, we're having this an issue in Davenport with the water line to the to the town that's privately owned, and FEMA will not uh, fund that either. Um, so that's a significant cost. Uh, but uh, private CSAs and private roads um, can look at different ways to create assessments in order to try to pay for the damages. But so far, we're being told that FEMA can't um, or won't pay for those damages. I thought that FEMA was supposed to be helpful in the event that people didn't have insurance and then the road, I mean, the road technically doesn't have insurance, right? Or. Yeah, I don't, um, I, I, I do not know this. I've just had the preliminary conversations uh -huh. and it hasn't looked good so far. Interesting. Um, I wonder if each in each uh, homeowner's insurance would pay a per percentage or something of that fee because it's, yeah, it's how you access your property. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's very possible. That'll be interesting to look at. Um, another person, Julie, wants to just say now that um, we're back and have seen all the work they've done in the past few weeks, it's just phenomenal. Thank you so much, Ryan, for advocating for the community. Oh, thank you. Um, what is, so I'm, I'm a partial loss 
claim. And I think there's a lot of people like that. And then there's also total loss claims that are going to want to live on their property or if their property's quite damaged, they're going to want to live on someone else's property. What, and I think typically like living in a trailer might not be up to code. So what is going to be allowed? Yeah. So one of the directions based on the community input was, um, was to both allow RVs or yurts or uh, tiny homes where people could build an ADU and then build their home uh, while they live in the ADU, uh, accessory dwelling units. So, um, so the short answer is um, that we are trying in the new, new system um, to allow people to live in these interim uh, uses on either their property or on others' property. The one um, criteria that, that people need to be aware of is, uh, as we saw in Santa Barbara, after the fires and then you had the rains and the mudslides um, that were deadly, that we're gonna try, we're gonna, we, need, we need to be really careful that when we site these tiny homes or yurts or RVs, that we're doing it in such a way that they aren't um, at danger from mudslides. Uh, or other, you know, other environmental disasters that can fall after this one. So as a homeowner, is it a good idea for us to have somebody come out? Like, I'm not sure exactly who it would be, a landscaper or some type of natural habitat ecologist to help us like walk our property and, and check the erosion uh, potential and then decide where to put those trailers and everything according to what they decide or see? Well, one of the, so there's two pieces to this. One part is we actually have a specialist team here um, from the state that's doing a watershed analysis because um, the, the Bonnie Dune and North Coast uh, and, and Boulder Creek is not only an area where people live, it's also the watershed for, the, for much of the county. Uh, so um, they are doing mapping to make sure uh that we're protecting the watershed and then we have public works doing the mapping to protect the roads so they're going to be a very aware of and the other infrastructure so they're going to be very aware of those things um, i think when you apply for your permit for this interim housing um that's one of the things that the, that the county is going to check to make sure uh that you're safe so even if i want to live in a so I'm thinking my house isn't livable. I want to live in a trailer because I'm nervous about people going on my property. And again, like the construction that's going to happen to fix my house. So I want to live in a trailer and then I'd like to move into an ADU that I don't have, but I'd like to build. So you're saying that I need to get a permit to live in the trailer and then a permit for the ADU because it doesn't exist yet. And then any permits to change the infrastructure of the house based on the damage. Correct. Okay, and so I can go to the Kaiser Permanente location and they can start to walk me through the process, but you were saying that there may not be anything really happening until next Tuesday? Uh, well, the, I think it's, it's not a bad idea to, to go and start the conversations either at Kaiser or the planning department. And by the way, I think um, for the interim use, from what I understand, it's, it's, it's gonna be a very short application. It's like, a, so I don't want people to get scared. Uh, right. Um, I th it's it's meant to be. It's meant just to make sure that everyone's clear on, you know, the water and the sewer and uh, the you know and and this erosion issue, just to make sure we're meeting basic health and safety. Right. Absolutely. That makes sense. And so, the planning department or the Kaiser Permanente is going to be able to have that. And so we'll start with the temporary dwelling unit, and then they'll be. Um, permits for the ADU or the house. Yeah. Exactly. And so you said next Tuesday, there'll be a more clear uh, understanding of the streamline process. Yeah. So well, on um, today is Thursday and in uh, it's three, three 30 in the afternoon in the next hour, the actually the agenda report will come out with what the planning department is planning to do and the timelines and um, uh, both community members like yourself and even me who hasn't read it yet uh, will be able to read it and see what the plan is and then on Tuesday the Board of Supervisors will take action uh, to, to authorize the planning department to move in a, in 
in a direction they recommend or the one that we think is the best direction. So it'll come out today, but you'll be able to weigh in on that. And will we be able to weigh in on that before you guys make a decision? Yeah. So, um, yeah. How, so I you, heard, how, how can we look at that? Yeah. So if you go to the uh, Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors, there's a link called Meeting Portal and you press on September 15th. Uh, the agenda will come up and this will be one of the agenda items. Read it through and you can either email me and just submit a comment, you know, if you want me to know, or you can submit a comment to the entire board uh, through the website so that they can, so that everybody can see what your thoughts are. Oh, that's great. I will post that in our groups so that people know. That's awesome. Um, let's see, do I have any other questions? I think that's, um, I'm, are you, you're, so with the election coming up, are you, you're not up for re-election, are you? I am not, uh, thank goodness, because the last thing I need is <laughs> one more crisis, one more thing to do. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not up. I'll just be uh, watching the election results uh, with my fingers crossed like the rest of the free world. Awesome, and so do you have any, um, maybe this is, you can choose to answer this or not, but You've done such a great job as mayor, as supervisor. What are you, what are your future plans? Do you continue to uh, want to stay as a supervisor, or maybe take the next step in politics? You know, um, uh, I really like the local level. Uh, you sort of get to be in the community you're fixing, and you can move uh, faster um, than certainly you can at the state and local level. And I also get to be I have an eight year old and a five year old, so I get to be home. Yeah. Uh, and so I don't have any interest in running for office and now, um, like unfortunately so many people in the community, uh, we now have a two year rebuilding process, uh, yeah. that I'm going to have to undertake together. And I feel a real commitment, um, to be there for that and to try to see this, this crisis through and not to mention the pandemic and the economic fallout of that. So, um, so I'm, I'm more than uh, stimulated and probably overstimulated by the work right now uh, at the local level. And I'll, I plan on being here as long as, um, you know, uh, as long as we can get this all done and the community will have me. Well, that's really reassuring, especially given the fact that we're hearing that we're going to have five or six different insurance adjusters. At least we'll have one supervisor. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Well, I so appreciate your time. Is there anything else that you uh, wish to share with us before we sign off? Um, you know, I think the only thing is um, we are, uh, just so everyone knows, uh, you know, um, what, I've been reaching out to my colleagues in Sonoma and other places who have been through this so that um, we aren't trying to reinvent the wheel and hopefully learning from some of their mistakes or uh, taking their best practices. Uh, and so um, I think we've all heard a lot of nightmare stories about paradise um, and the long, slow recovery process or Sonoma and Santa Rosa and the long, slow recovery process. Um, this will not be an easy process or a fast process, but we're going to do our best to uh, make it much, much better than that and um, get people back to back into their homes uh, as quickly as possible. Help us. Um, I you know, a lot of us have never experienced this, and you seem like a seasoned veteran. Though this may be your first wildfire. Yeah, this is. Uh, this is. Um, I'm learning more about debris removal than I ever thought possible. <laughs> well, thank you so much. We so appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. All right. Have a great afternoon. All right. You too. Bye. Bye. Bye.